Okay, if I did it right, we're recording. And last month I created a YouTube channel. So uh, now our uh, meetings will be able to be uh, saved forever. <laughs> They'll be on the YouTube channel. And I'll post the link after, um, after everything's uploaded. But I think we're gonna have a good crowd tonight. We got a lot of new members um, joined in the, since the last meeting. Um, and just on the uh, Facebook pages, the number of people who clicked and said they were going to attend was the highest I've ever seen. Now we know that that's not always the case just because people say they're coming or not coming <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean anything, mean anything, but I think we're gonna have a big crowd. One more minute. <clears throat> Mike, with that COVID shot, um, if you do have side effects like that, I've read online, plus my doctor said it means you do have some antibiotic antibodies in your system. Okay. So that's good. I had several side effects. <laughs> yeah. We'll hopefully get to find out soon. Mm-hmm. All right, let's go ahead and uh, get started. So welcome everybody. Um, glad to see everybody here on a Friday night. Um, I know that, like I was just alluding to a minute ago, it's a lot of new members. I hope uh, some of them are on. I see a few new faces. Uh, some of you I've uh, messaged or um, emailed with. Um, I'm helping you getting your membership set up and getting on the uh, paid uh, member Facebook page. So uh, welcome, and if this is your first meeting. I uh, hope you enjoy it and uh, looking forward to some point where we can actually meet in person again. Um, probably not too <laughs> well into the year, but we'll keep these uh, Zoom meetings uh, going. Uh, Rob Knight is here. He is our uh, speaker tonight. Uh, introduce him in a, a little bit. But let me see if I can get the slideshow started. Share screen. All right, there we go. Can, can people see the screen? Yep. All right. So for tonight's meeting, it's going to be the usual. We're going to talk a little bit of business. We've got actually have events to talk about um, tonight. Um, Rob Knight is going to um, do his presentation. And then we'll have our photo challenge. And we got a little, we're going to try something new um, after uh, Rob's presentation right before the start of the uh, photo challenge. And I'll explain it when we get to that. We actually have um, 20 entries in the uh, challenge tonight. So that's the most we've had in a while. So apparently we've all seen uh, bridges. <laughs> so that's gonna be good. So um, if you uh, haven't paid dues and you'd like to pay dues, they are uh, $20 for an individual, $30 for a family. Um, the main difference is you get a lot of extra benefits as a paid member, um, including workshops and um, early invitations to some field trips, which is going to be important. You'll find out soon. Uh, but you can see some of the uh, rest of the benefits there. Um, however, you don't have to be a paid member to attend the meetings, to go on uh, field trips, to uh, post on uh, Facebook. 
but if you are a paid member, there's certain um, extra benefits you get. And all the money we take in um, through dues goes directly to the club. Um, it pays for fees, it pays for our uh, annual Zoom membership, um, our website that uh, we're building. Um, also, when we get up to it in a minute, talking about the Quinlan show, uh, we have cash prizes for that. So um, that's all comes out of your uh, dues. Um, and as I said, we have a new website coming soon. It's going to be the same address, uh, NorthGeorgiaPhotographyClub.com. Uh, Corey Huntington is working on that for us and don't really have anything to report on it yet. Uh, but as soon as it goes live, uh, we'll have uh, uh, posts on uh, Facebook. Uh, but we've been kind of discussing it and I think it's going to be um, a really nice site. And then we've got our uh, Quinlan show, which ends in uh, two days. So I'm going to let um, Lisa talk about that real quick. Um, some um, information about picking up the photos as well as announcing uh, the winners, including the uh, People's Choice Award, which we've been uh, waiting on. So like Mike said, the show runs through uh, this Sunday, February 21st. Um, if you did not have a chance to get over to the Quinlan, or if you don't think you'll have a chance to get over to the Quinlan, um, I did do a, a video uh, tour of our exhibit, and Mike has posted that on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to view it there, it's out there now, um, and you can uh, take a look at it there. Um, if you have um, photos in the exhibit, um, the the date that you can start picking up your photos is the 23rd. Um, I would suggest um, picking them up within seven days or so. You have 30 days in which to pick them up, sooner the better. Um, and as far as our winners, we had four categories. Um, our first category was landscape. Our three, um, we had first, second, and third place in each category. In landscape, first place was Tommy Meyer. Second place was Jim Perkins. Third place was Jack Anthony. In our macro category, first place was Dana Hornback. Second place was Randy Lewis. And third place was Melinda Allen. Our urban category, first place was Stephanie Hahn. Second place was Dana Hornback. Third place was Benjamin Hines. And in our open category, first place was Chuck Kazina. Second place was Melinda Allen. And third place was Bob Kelly. And um, during uh, the duration of our, of our exhibit, we uh, had everybody that came and toured the exhibit vote for our People's Choice Award. So we are announcing that tonight. I'm not sure if the winner is um, attending the meeting tonight or not. Um, but the winner of the People's Choice Award uh, with her water drop uh, photo was Melinda Allen. So congratulations to Melinda. Yeah, I haven't um, seen Melinda on here yet, but uh, okay. uh, we will we will let her know and um, what we'll we're going to do in the first place in each category, as well as the uh, um, People's Choice winner win uh, cash prizes. I'm gonna, I have everybody's um, mailing address from your um, entry forms. And um, I'm gonna give that to um, Herman. He's actually out of town this weekend. So I'm gonna get that to him on uh, Monday and uh, he'll go ahead and mail checks to the winners. Okay. I have one more announcement um, regarding Inman Park. Um, for any of you that are new to the club, Inman Park is a coffee shop in Gainesville uh, where the club maintains the um, exhibit, the art exhibit on the walls of the coffee shop. Um, it's a rotating monthly exhibit um, and it ranges from photography to all kinds of different mediums of art, artwork. Um, and I uh, manage the exhibit there. Um, the exhibit um, schedule remains pretty full. It's pretty full through uh, 2022 two for the most part. Um, however, I do have an opening in May of this year. So I wanted to announce that if anybody would like to 
uh, exhibit this year in May at Inman Park or possibly share an exhibit with somebody else, that month is open right now. So if you're interested, um, contact me, let me know soon. So that's all I have for tonight. All right. Well, thank you, Lisa. Lisa, you did a, a great job running the show, uh, curating the show. This is the first time we've done something uh, like this and hopefully it'll lead to um, the others. So thank you so much for all your hard work on that, Lisa. All right, our upcoming trips. We actually have some trips scheduled. We're not just talking about them now. Uh, first, we have an impromptu trip tomorrow morning for anyone who's interested. This is not an official club event, uh, but it's sunrise at the 17th Street Bridge um, in Atlanta by Atlantic Station. Uh, this is put on by the um, Atlanta uh, Photography uh, uh, Group and uh, Paul, and my mind just slipped on his last name, uh, but he spoke to us last year. Uh, Paul, da Paul Daniels. Group. Paul Daniels, yes. Um, and so he told us that we always have a open um, invitation for any of his events. He usually announces them the Monday before. So... Um, I uh, posted about it on uh, Facebook and just wanted to mention it here uh, uh, tonight. So anybody who's interested in that, uh, Sunrise is I think around 7.15, 7.30 tomorrow. He recommends being there by about 6.45 and you can park at Atlantic Station for free uh, for two hours. And so I'm gonna let Dick talk about uh, Zoo Atlanta and the uh, EarthQuest uh, Birds of Prey. Okay, so first the zoo. Um, if we can get 15 people to pay up in advance, we can get a group ticket or 15 or more, um, which will bring the price down from $30 to $20 per person. Um, the downside of that is that I will buy the ticket and I only get one ticket and we'll all have to go in together. Um, so think about that, but I'm going to post the event tomorrow to the members only page and see how much response we get. Um, and then in a couple of weeks, I'll open it up to the full group. If we don't have, well, actually I'll open it up either way, If we, but if we don't get a significant response, I may open it up sooner just to see if I can get to the 15, um, just because it's cheaper. Say again? What time? Um, uh, as I'll post to the thing, I'm thinking that, so the March 20th is a Saturday. Um, and I'm thinking to go in the afternoon, like two 30 or three and, and get the later sun. Although looking at the sun today, I'm not sure that's the swiftest idea. Um, particularly because the, uh, time will have changed by that time. Um, but I, I, as I will post in the, in the uh, event, when I put it online, the time, we have a little bit of time to decide on because I don't have to buy until two weeks ahead of time. So I will be open to commentary on whether we go in the morning or in the afternoon or what. Um, I'll also be open, I guess, if people really wanted to, we could do multiple events. Uh, one on Saturday, one on Sunday, maybe something like that. I hesitate to go a little t past the 20th of March because we start running into Easter. Um, so that's that, and it'll go live tomorrow on the website or Facebook page tomorrow. Um, if I can offer some advice as a zoo member and a, and a frequent visitor with my kids, it gets crazy in there on Saturdays. And especially I was on, on the afternoons, like it's busy in the morning on Saturdays. So by the afternoon, it's, it's, it's that's a zoo. The, <laughs> so just, well, the, peop the people at the zoo thought it would best come in the afternoon. Actually, the best time to come from, from the people at the zoo is actually Tuesday afternoon. Right. For um, sure. And, and I would be perfectly well. I'm retired. I can go then. I suspect most people can't. That's why I picked a Saturday. I, it's not that I really want to go on a Saturday, but the other good news is that they have relaxed their one-way circuit through the zoo somewhat, not entirely, but a lot of it. 
whereas before you were stuck only going one way, you couldn't turn around and go back. Now you can. Um, and the food stands are open as well. Anyway, we'll see how that one goes. Um, the EarthQuest Birds of Prey will be April 17th at 5 p.m. Um, at the Milford Family Farm off Dr. Bramblett Road, North of Cumming. Um, that's a, it's a family farm. We'll be, the birds will be able to fly out over a pasture where we'll be able to see them and shoot away to our little heart's content, as well as having plenty of fence posts and other things for them to perch on. Um, the birds will be available to us for about 60 to 90 minutes, probably four birds, uh, two hawks, an owl, and a condor. If you haven't ever seen a condor, they're amazing. They're huge, They're about a 10 foot wingspan. Um, you almost don't need a telephoto lens. Um, in any event, after the, so if we shoot five to 6.30, then we'll be getting on towards sunset. And at that time of year, sunset over the pasture ought to be really good, assuming mother nature cooperates. Um, I will also be putting that up on the Facebook page tomorrow. The cost is $30 per person. That all goes to EarthQuest. None of that does. That's their charge. Um, and after that, I'm cautiously optimistic I can organize some sort of uh, wildflower hunt in sometime in April or May. I have to think about that one a little bit once I get my second vaccination. And as usual, I'm open to any and all ideas put them up on Facebook or send them to me privately, whichever. That's what I got, Mike. All right. And uh, one thing we're gonna do for both the zoo and for EarthQuest, we're gonna go ahead and put a payment link on the uh, Facebook page. And I'll also send out an email once um, <clears throat> we have that up on the Facebook page um, to everybody so that uh, um, um, you'll have that link. We're gonna take the payments in advance. Um, that way we can keep track with how many people are going. Uh, with the zoo, we wanna make sure we get the 15 people for the, um, for the uh, group discount. Uh, if we don't get enough people for the group discount, we can still do the zoo trip, but uh, it'll just cost more. And uh, so all the instructions will be online. So just watch that. It's gonna be the same system we use for the uh, membership fees uh, square. So um, everybody should be pretty familiar with it by now. It uh, should be pretty easy. Um, the other thing we wanted to discuss real quick is um, workshops. Um, we don't have anything scheduled yet, but we're hoping to get something um, started, uh, hopefully in spring, maybe uh, March or April. Uh, Timmy, are you um, on? I thought I saw her. Well, Timmy Schaller <clears throat> is working with um, Lori on uh, workshops. Lori is in Florida right now, uh, but uh, Timmy is uh, uh, working on getting stuff set up and uh, we may do an online workshop on Zoom. Um, so we'll see about that. Um, what we like that we were talking about has something um, out in the open where people can uh, participate and we can still uh, be socially distant. Uh, hey there, Mike, can you hear me? Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was trying out a new mic and well, it didn't work. So All right. um, didn't even learn. Uh, <laughs> hi, everybody. Um, uh, what I wanted to do real quick um, was I just wanted to share some of the ideas that we got from the survey. And that way, um, if there was somebody who was interested in leading a workshop, um, that you could contact me so that we could work on getting the schedule. Um, so these are, let me pull up my list again. Um, these are some obviously um, editing was huge on the list. Um, we've got Mr. Knight this evening, so that's awesome. Um, another one was just the basics. Um, several people asked for the basics, you know, how to shoot in manual, aperture priority mode, et cetera. 
Um, so if somebody would be willing to lead, you know, one of our more professional members, if they would be willing to lead um, something like that. Um, another one that was a popular idea was a, a critique type workshop um, where maybe we, um, you know, set up some sort of um, round table almost discussion where people could have their photographs and then um, various members just kind of critique. Somebody said like a critique coffee um, if somebody wanted to lead that. Um, another one was using filters um, if somebody would lead that one. Um, Another one that I thought was a great idea was a like a practice workshop um, where we could set up scenarios um, or go to a particular place where there'd be a bunch of different scenarios, let people practice the shooting and then kind of let others help them out and, you know, critique on site and things like that. Um, and then um, night sky and long exposure, which I think I have somebody for that um, for our, our first one here. Um, I think we probably want to do that one as a, um, we'd probably do that twice. Um, the person that I have for now would do it via Zoom. Um, she's in Northern Michigan, but then we could also do one later in the summer, um, you know, like Milky Way moon type shots um, to kind of use those tricks and tips, um, you know, apply them. And then the last thing that was popular was uh, website creation, marketing, that sort of stuff. So um, those were the, the main topics that I got from the survey. So if anybody is interested, I'm going to put my email um, in the chat area. Um, and, then, um, and then you can also message me. I'll put my name again. Um, and you can message me on Facebook. So in either way, um, you can get a hold of me if you're interested in doing those workshops. So I got uh, distracted by uh, stuff showing up on my screen on this. Uh, my screen is different because um, I had to um, reinstall Windows. So I'm just glad that I'm actually able to get Zoom to work. <laughs> so anyways, thank you, Timmy. We appreciate that. And we're looking forward um, to getting some workshops done. Um, with the night one, we... Um, Almost um, always do a, a Milky Way uh, shoot during the year. Uh, don't know when or where it'll be this year. We might do Notley Lake again, uh, but um, that's one thing I think we've discussed is possibly making that one of the uh, workshops as opposed to just um, shooting. Because inevitably, whenever we do the uh, Milky Way, there's always people there for their first time. And so uh, definitely want to help um, everyone out. So, um, Got the chat. The chat popped up on a screen behind uh, other stuff. That was what distracted me. So uh, yeah, Timmy's email is in there, um, or you can contact her on um, on Facebook if you have any uh, suggestions or want to uh, help out with a uh, with a workshop. So. Now we're going to do our presentation. Uh, Rob Knight is here. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, Lightroom Basics and uh, Organize and Optimize. Uh, give me just a second here and I'll let you share your screen. There we go. All right, Rob, you should be able to share your screen. Mm -hmm. I, I was already uh, looking over it. Um, a little bit earlier, so I think I'm good. Are, are you ready to rock? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, Zoom does a really funny thing with screen sharing where some usually you can share just one window. Um, but with the way that it works in Lightroom is that it shares the the main grid as one window and then the left panels is another window or the right panel so you can choose which section of lightroom so i have to share the whole screen so if, if the um uh if the zoom window is distracting i'm trying to minimize it as much as possible here there we go okie dokie so um i've been using lightroom since it was uh, a public beta and at the time they were uh, Adobe and, and Apple were sort of racing to get their 
professional photography uh, organizing apps uh, out in, to market. And it's funny because Aperture came out first and for some reason Apple stopped supporting that. But um, I had been, I've been using Photoshop since around 1995. So it, it made a lot more sense to me to use the Adobe product because all the language was the same and the tools were similar and, and that sort of thing. And over the years, they've, they keep adding things and improving the, the processing and the tools and, and all these things that uh, I use every day in Lightroom. And um, one thing I've noticed over the years is once I developed a, a system to organize my pictures, that hasn't changed. And I remember when I first started using Lightroom and, and it, was, uh, it was this brand new thing and you know, I was a, a, a little burgeoning photographer and uh, you end up with even, even a few pictures, even a, a few, a couple of hundred pictures. If you decide midstream that you're going to have to change the way that you, that you name your files or change where everything is stored, it's a hassle, even, even if you don't have a lot of images. Then at this point I've got, let's see, I've got over 300,000 images in my Lightroom catalog. So this is not a thing that that you should take lightly as far as deciding how you're going to organize your pictures even within Lightroom. So that's what I want to talk about today is, is how to get started. And if you're a new Lightroom user or you haven't used it long, then this is the perfect time to, to get organized because um, you know Lightroom is such a, I think it's a really easy tool to get the hang of, but um, there's also so many options that I know it can be daunting. So if you don't know, um, you know, oh, okay, well, you can organize your pictures by folders or by uh, collections or smart collections or all the, there's all these options, but it's hard to know, especially in the beginning, which one of those options is right for you. So I'm going to show you the, the system that I use. And I didn't, I didn't invent this, this system. My, my friend Kevin Ames wrote a book gosh, years ago called The Digital Photographer's Notebook. And then he subsequently wrote a column for Photoshop User Magazine called The Digital Photographer's Notebook. And um, uh, Kevin's a really smart guy. And he was a really, what? give me a break. Sorry about that. Let me jump out of here. Um, it, he was a really early adopter of digital technology and, and a really early adopter of Lightroom. And um, I remember talking to him at his studio at one point and he had, uh, you know, some people have a Drobo for storage and it holds multiple hard drives. Well, Kevin had, I think at the time he had 12 Drobos and he had over a million images in his, in his catalogs. So he's a guy that knows how to find stuff. He knows how to store things and he knows how to find it easily. And um, so anyway, without further ado, Kevin's system in, uh, in that book was to, to have a serial number uh, on each folder that uh, correlated to a particular date and then a descriptive name for that folder. And that folders are the first line of organization in Lightroom. And it's really, I think it's really important to understand that nothing goes into Lightroom, right? Lightroom is a database, okay? So you put pictures on your hard drive, on hopefully on an external hard drive and not on your computer itself. And then you tell Lightroom where they are. And then Lightroom keeps track of them. Lightroom tracks uh, the changes that you make to those pictures. And it doesn't ever do anything to your original files. It doesn't even open your original file. It makes a copy of your file so that it can show you what it will look like with your changes. So, excuse me, that's really important to understand. And so when you're in the library module, like we are, uh, you've got the folders panel. And the folders are the actual physical location of your files on a hard drive somewhere. And one of the things I've always liked about Lightroom is that it can keep track of multiple hard drives, multiple sources of where you're gonna keep your photos. Uh, some things like, like photos on the Mac or even the Aperture uh, program that Apple used to make, they would take your pictures and copy them into this, this place, you know, like the, the Aperture library was a, was a physical place and all of your pictures went into that place. And I can tell you from uh, consulting with several clients now, it's a pain to find your pictures if an application takes them and puts them in this proprietary place. So 
Lightroom allows you to put your pictures wherever you want and just tell Lightroom where they are. So that's that's important. The folders panel is when you when you hit the import button here and I'll tell Lightroom, take the pictures off of this uh, memory card and put them into this folder. This is where they're going to go. This is, uh, this is where you're going to see all those things. And the cool thing about it is it can keep track of hard drives that are not attached to the computer at the moment. Okay, so you'll see in my list here, Macintosh hard drive. Obviously, that's my, my startup drive. That's my computer's hard drive. Uh, and I do have a few things here and there. If people send me pictures for different projects, they might be uh, on my desktop and I don't move them to my storage hard drive. So they might be still on my, um, my hard drive, but it's not, there's not many there. And then I've got down the list, drive one, drive three, drive four, uh, to my current drive, which is drive seven. And it has a little green uh, light next to it. And notice how these other hard drives don't have the green light on them. And that's because they're not plugged into the computer right now. But Lightroom still knows that these pictures exist. Okay, so if I click on it, it can even show me uh, a preview of what's in that folder, even though that hard drive is not connected because Lightroom has the, the working preview files. And so it can show me that. Now, um, I can edit the metadata on the file. I can put a name and a, and a title and things like that, but I can't open those in the develop module and you know change the exposure and do any editing to those files until I plug in the hard drive that has those original files but it's just handy as you go down the road, you put, I always put my images on an external hard drive because eventually that hard drive is gonna be full, right? And at that point, I get a new hard drive and I plug that one in and then my next round starts to go there. So I've got pictures from uh, as far back as, as 2006, 2005 that are still in this, this system. So um, for me, I don't need to know that uh, these pictures here were taken in September or October. That doesn't really make any difference to me. So I don't need a serial number that has 2020, October 15th. I, I don't need that. I, I don't need all that information. What I want personally is for my, uh, all my shoots to remain in chronological order, okay? And, um, and the other thing I want is, as much information as I can get to read so I know what's in that folder. So if I just, if, and you see you have limited characters in this panel, uh, you know, I can, and I can make this bigger if I want to, but I would rather have more, more screen real estate for my photos, right? So um, if I have, so I use a four digit serial number here. If I had, if this serial number was 2020, October, uh, October 16th, then by the time I get rid of, get to all those numbers, I only have a few characters left to show me what's actually in the folder. And I want, I want to see more of the descriptive name than I do the serial number or the date. So um, in order for me to keep the pictures in chronological order, uh, because if I, if I just did it by the name of what's in the file, then they would be alphabetical. And I don't want that either, okay? So I could just say, okay, this is, uh, this is folder number zero one and it's a Costa Rica workshop. But then I've got zero one, zero two. I don't know when those pictures were made. I do a lot of Costa Rica workshops. So a folder that said zero five Costa Rica workshop wouldn't help me know what was in that folder or when they were taken. So um, my serial number starts with two digits and that's the year, okay? The, the first two digits are the year, the second two are simply numerical order. And, uh, and if you shoot, uh, I've always done just four digits it, and I've never even come close to getting to 100. So uh, that's why I still use two digits after, gosh, years uh, that I've been using this particular system. Um, if you're shooting weddings or uh, made probably with the, the new role that I just took, I'll be shooting a lot of uh, architecture and real estate. So I'll be shooting more individual shoots. I might use a, a five digit serial number so I can have 001 instead of 01 as my first shoot. But the point is I can look here and say, okay, all of these folders, all these images were made in 2020. 
This is the first shoot that I did in 2020 because it's 2001, right? So this is the last shoot, shoot that I did in 2019. So you can see I only did 34 folders full of images in, in, uh, in over the course of a year. Um, and if I go back uh, beyond that, these are from 2016. These are from 2017. So it's really easy for me to figure out when that was. Um, and then I might not remember that the Route 66 workshop was in October, but I remember that it came after Grand Tetons. So I want them to stay in that order. And that's what helps me to find these things. And when I decided that this is how I was going to store my files, let's see, that would have been 2006, I think. It's 2021. I mean, I haven't changed this system since I first implemented it because it has allowed me over all these years to find what I need easily. Um, and to me, that's a big deal. If I don't feel like uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that uh, if I feel like this simple system is working for me and I don't have to change it, that's fantastic. Uh, and I just use it year after year and it, and it works great. So, you know, if, if that sounds like something that would work for you, then I can definitely recommend and I can tell you in practice, in real life, it works really easily to, to organize a lot of pictures. Um, I see, I, I'm not going to necessarily answer questions as they come in, but I did see something in the chat. Um, and I'm going to, I'm in sort of a stopping point here. So I'm going to see. It was just a quick warning about the Oh, laptop my laptop, laptop is it? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Thank I, you. That's a good yeah. point because I was moving everything around. <laughs> good job. Thank you. See, I, it's good that I checked that. Okay. Um, so, uh, once the uh, once my images are in this one folder, that is basically all of the organization I'm going to do within the folder. Okay, so I don't want to have to if I need a picture outside of Lightroom. The last thing I want to do if I'm looking for a picture from Costa Rica in January, the last thing that I want to do is go to my hard drive and look at my Costa Rica January folder, and then look at the Tuesday folder and then look, I, I don't want to get into folders and folders and folders. I, it, it's fine for me to have 5,400 pictures in one folder, okay? Because the rest of the organization that I'm going to do is going to be within Lightroom. It's going to be part of the database because, uh, well, I'll show you, I'll show you why, but I use uh, collections. Um, the, so collections, are in this next panel down here. I'll close the uh, folders panel and go to collections. And again, collections are basically a function of the Lightroom database. Collections work if you're uh, uh, an iTunes user, they work kind of like a playlist, okay? So the reason I would use, that I use collections instead of moving things around in folders is because I can have the same image in multiple collections. And all it is, is basically a pointer to that original file. So I can have the, I can have the same photo in a wildlife collection and a birds collection and a Costa Rica collection and uh, a telephoto lens collection, whatever I want. I can have the same image in, in four or five places and I haven't copied my original one time. Uh, those, those four or five instances, whatever I wanna do, all, all refer to the same original file. So for me, that's cool. I can organize in not only one way, I don't have to decide, okay, this is how I'm gonna organize my things. I can organize them in 50 different ways if I want to, or if I need to. Um, for me, maybe I, so just to show you the options for collections, if you hit the plus button here, you've got create a collection, which is, sort of like the envelope that you get from the photo map, right? It's a, it's a little folder that you can just drag and drop things into and move things around. You can do a smart collection, which I'll show you, which is a collection, it's a, like an envelope, but you can make rules for that collection so that you can tell Lightroom to automatically put things together with specific criteria. And then a collection set. And I still wanna to talk to somebody at Adobe about why collection set is not at the top of the list because it, it's your top organizational level anyway. So for me, the collection set is kind of like the shoebox that you put all of your envelopes in, right? And it even has kind of a shoebox icon. 
So all of these are collection sets. And you can make multiple collection sets. You can put a collection set inside of a collection set, which I've done here with this uh, 2101 Costa Rica folder. Notice, coincidentally, it has the same name as the folder where the images are. Okay, that just helps me keep, keep track of it. Um, and inside of that, I have a smart collection, which is, uh, it has this little cog, right? The little yellow wheel there, that indicates that it's a smart collection. And then I have these other just, you know, if that's a smart collection, I guess these are dumb collections. These are just, just folders to put things in. So um, in this case, I have literally just selected images that I want to use for a class demonstration, excuse me, and then put them together into a collection. And they are all from Costa Rica, so I put it inside of this collection set. I have another uh, collection here that is images that I want to share from this trip. And this little icon here indicates that this collection is synchronized with Lightroom CC, with Lightroom in the cloud. So what that means, if this is checked, then I can open Lightroom on my phone or my iPad, and I can access those images from anywhere. And um, the cool thing about that is not only can I access the images, I can download them to my phone, I can post them on Instagram, we can do whatever. Um, I can actually open up Lightroom on my phone and, and make edits to those images, and the edits will synchronize to my desktop, which for me has been uh, really handy. And um, just a quick note about social media posts. You can edit all day long. You can have uh, a calibrated monitor and know everything about color management and everything else and work as smart as you know how to work. But then when you put that thing on your phone, it might not look right, right? Phone screens, are there's no real way to calibrate it. There's no way to calibrate everybody's Facebook. There's no way to calibrate everybody's Instagram. So for me, I'll take, I'll get an image like I like it and then I'll open it on in Lightroom on my phone and I see what it looks like on the phone. And a lot of times I'll have to make little adjustments um, with, at the last minute. And then I download a version that I know looks good on the phone. So something, something to think about, especially if you're used to maybe exporting JPEGs from Lightroom and then you put them online and they don't look right. Um, that can sort of bridge that gap a little bit. So, so a collection is just, it is what it is. Um, but a smart collection has, has rules and I'm gonna show you what that means. I'll uh, show you what the rules are for this smart collection. So the option here that I use is to match all of the following rules. Uh, the, you can match any or none, um, but my first rule here, so I'll take this away. So if I just leave this collection like this, then the pick flag is flagged. So that means any, any uh, image in my catalog that I, that I put, I hit the P on the keyboard and I add a pick flag to would automatically be collected into this collection. Okay, so I don't wanna do that with all my picks from 300,000 images. So I'm gonna hit the plus button here to add another rule and narrow it down just a little bit. And uh, so I'm gonna put the source, the uh, folder, right? Cause that's the actual location where these Costa Rica pictures are downloaded. Now, here's another reason I love using a four digit serial number because now all I have to do is put 2101. I don't have to put 2101 underscore Costa Rica, make sure I have all the caps right and everything. I could just use my serial number because that's a unique serial number within my catalog, all right? And so now Lightroom is gonna go ahead and look at this folder and any picture I put a pick flag on is gonna be automatically collected. And uh, so there's 282 picks there. Now, um, when I go through these original, like in this case, this is from a week of photographing mostly birds and wildlife. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm using the motor drive and I've taken a lot of frames. Um, so I go through these images and put a pick flag, right? Which you can do a, a few different ways. Um, if you're holding over the, the little slide here, the, that's, this is the flag here in the corner. You can, you can do here, or as you double click on the image, you can hit P on the keyboard to add a, add a pick flag, uh, U to unflag, 
But, um, but I'll go through these and pick out the images that are um, moder basically close to what I intended when I took the picture. So the exposure is pretty good. They're in focus. Um, they might not be Pulitzer Prize winning images, but they're, they're images that are not terrible, right? That's, that's what I put a pick on. If I have to talk myself into it, it doesn't get a flag. Okay, it's just a sort of gut check reaction. Um, a lot of times I'll go through with this view. I'll hit shift tab on the keyboard and hide the, the panels on the side. And I'll look through here because when you're looking at the images in this thumbnail view like this, you're, you're not focused on what the moment was or what you were thinking when you were shooting it. You're focused on the graphic, right? At that point, you're focused on really the visual impact of these pictures. And you can see like this is, there's just not much going on here. Even if this bird is in focus, it doesn't really make any difference. The picture's not much to look at, right? Um, so a lot of times I'll do that and kind of go through one pass like, you know, that way. And then there's some times when I know a shot is, is uh, like I remember taking the shot and it was a particular moment with, you know, an animal or something like that. And I know it's in sharp focus and I know I'm gonna maybe crop it or something like that. But um, that's something to think about too, when you're trying to edit your own images. Cause I know a lot of times that's the hardest part is knowing what's, what's good, what's not good. It's really easy to get uh, emotionally involved with your pictures. And um, you know, if you have to explain to somebody why it's a good photo, it might not be that good a photo, right? Um, if you have to explain how this, this beautiful moment happened and that's why it's good, then that's a great picture for you, but it might not be you know, a, a picture that everyone is gonna have the same reaction to. That I, I go by that, um, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Um, and I've judged photography contests where Sorry, I'm getting off on a little tangent, but I've judged photography contests where they show the name of the picture and they allow the, the photographer to name the image and put a little description of it as, as if that would make the picture better or worse. And for me, I think that's completely beside the point of a photography contest. Like if you have to tell me what your picture's about and what the story is and why it's good, then maybe it's not, right? I mean, a picture to me should stand on its own, should the photograph should evoke whatever it is you're trying to evoke. The photograph should convey the story that you're trying to tell, right? Um, and I, I hope that doesn't sound, make me sound like a uh, grumpy son of a bitch, but uh, you know, it's photography. That's what we're doing. We're, we're communicating visually. So um, that's, that's what I try to do with my own images and, and try to get away because sometimes amazing things happen and you're there to photograph it, but you don't get an amazing picture. It's still an amazing experience. And I think that's important as well, is that you can, you, you, there's lots of times when I, I don't have the lens that I need for whatever's happening. And, and I just, instead of beating myself up and uh, being frustrated because I didn't get the shot, I can just enjoy the moment and I don't have to be a photographer right then. I can just be a human being that's having an amazing time. And that's okay too. So like I said, sorry, a little tangent, but um, so once I go through and add those pick flags, I'm, it's pretty rare that I'm even gonna go back to this folder of you know, 5,500 pictures. I'm going to go down here, I'm going to make a smart collection so that as I go through and, and add pics to these, it's, all these pictures are automatically collected. And um, it, the other way that you can do this, um, you can put your pick flags on and then you can use, uh, this is called the library filter. It's at the top of the grid. And, um, and if you don't see that, you can press the backslash key to, uh, to bring that back if you accidentally hit the backslash and hide the library filters. Um, but you can hit attribute and select the pick flags. So now it's only showing me the pick flags, right? So I can take these, I can hit command or control A and select all of those images, okay? Then I can go in the collections panel and hit the plus and I can create a collection and I could call it Costa Rica Picks. Um, 
And I could say include selected photos. I could even synchronize right here with Lightroom if I want to, whatever. I can put them inside my Costa Rica set in 2021, right? I can do that. that. That's the same thing. That gets me to the same place. I still am gonna have a collection with all of these pictures that have a pick flag. But let's say I go back um, and I realize, oh, I've got a, a memory card that I forgot to download in this from this trip. Let me go add, let me go through those and add pick flags to those. Well, now I have to go through and remember to, okay, let me do this again. Let me go ahead and use my filters and find my picks just in the new ones and put those, I got to drag those and drop those into my collection. Well, if I'm using a smart collection, then anything, I, if I add a pick flag, it's automatically in there. If I decide, you know what, that's not the best shot. If I'm trying to decide between this picture and this picture and, um, you know, maybe this one's not as, it's not in focus like I thought it was. I can take the flag off. Well, guess what? It comes out of this smart collection, right? So for me, that's a much easier, uh, much more flexible way of keeping track of what's going on. And then after that, this is where I go if I wanna look at those pictures. I don't go back through 5,000 images every time I wanna look for something. I, I just go to this collection because I know that these are the pictures that the exposure is good and they're sharp focus and, and that kind of thing. So, and even some of these are not, obviously that's not a great picture. <laughs> it just happens to be in focus. So I put a big flag on it, but so if I take that off, now it's gone. It's not in the smart collection and I don't have to worry about it. Um, so now I'll go through these and you can see some of these have a star at the bottom. Right. My my second pass through these images is not a pass of 5000 pictures. It's a pass of these 281 images. And on these, I'll stop at the shots that are. Uh, that I think are pretty good. OK, they're my favorite pictures. The they're not only in focus, they're not only exposed well, but I like like in this one, I like the, the way the toucan is facing. I like the the composition. Um, I, I think that's a that's a cool picture. That's something I'm gonna I'm gonna want to share. I'm gonna want to work on. So um, those images get a star. For me, I don't do. I, I know a lot of people who use five stars for the best ones, and then four stars and three stars and this and that. But for me, it's if it's not five stars, then I don't want to show it to you. You know what I mean? Um, if if my five star images are my best favorite ones then what would I do with a three-star image, right? If those are my pretty decent images, though, then they just, they just languish in my picks folder and that I don't, you know, I might not do something with them. But the images with a star, they're the ones that, again, they get shared, they, they get printed, that kind of thing. Um, and I'll take those images and I can do the same thing. I can make a, um, let's do that. Let's go make a smart collection and call it, Streak stars, put it inside the 2101 collection. Now I'm going to match all the following rules. Okay, I'll go ahead and say that the source folder contains 2101. And then that the rating is, is one star. Right, so now it's going to look in that folder. Anything I put a star on is going to automatically be collected in here. And now I have 13 images in there. Uh, that have a star. So, um, and once I've set this up, as I go through my picks and I might do some other edits, um, then let's see, find one that's not terrible. So I can take this picture and add a star and guess what? Now it pops into here automatically. So a lot of times I will set these uh, once I start editing, I'll go ahead and make this smart collection. And then as I roll, as you can imagine, I don't sit down and go through 5,000 pictures at one time. Um, and if, I've, if I take my computer with me on location, then I try to go through that as I go. So I don't have to come home and then just pile through all these images. Um, so that's the beauty of, of these smart collections is, you know, throughout the week, let's say every, I might spend 30 minutes a night going through and adding and picking out my favorite images. Okay, cool, they're automatically collected. The next night, same thing happens. The images get dumped into this folder. I add the pick flag, they automatically get collected. Great, right? Um, so to me, that works really well 
Um, and there's other ways that you can organize things. You can do color labels, okay? And, and so what that looks like, if I, if I click on this image, if I right click on it, um, I can set a color label. So I make it, maybe I make it red, right? So now that really stands out in my, uh, in my grid. Okay, so uh, when I used to do a lot of bracketed shots and do a lot of high dynamic range images, a series of images that, that was a bracket, I would select them all and uh, click on the first image, shift click on the last. And then I use a lot of keyboard shortcuts in Lightroom. So I press six on the keyboard and that makes all of those red. So then I knew that anything that was red, oh, okay, I'm gonna, that reminds me that I'm gonna go through when I'm editing and I'm gonna take those three bracketed shots and I'm gonna blend those exposures together, right? Um, so things like that. Again, you can organize these however you want to. Um, it's just whatever makes the most sense to you. And when you make smart collections, the, the possibilities are really, endless as far as what you can look for. You can do by rating and pick flags like we looked at, label color, um, the text of the label, how they've been processed, where they come from, uh, the file name itself, right? Uh, camera info, you can even do focal length, shutter speed, all sorts of things, which lens you used, which I always thought it was kind of weird. Like why would you need shutter speed or aperture until I wrote a book? about photography and I was like, oh, I really need some long exposure shots. Oh, hey, I can use, <laughs> I can use these filters and look for images that were made at 15th of a second. And um, so whatever you're trying to do, you can probably do it in like whatever your criteria is. Um, if I'm using, um, if I'm doing a, a project that I'm gonna be sharing a lot of times, like for uh, say the class demo, I might go through and add the keyword um, you know, if, if I haven't added keywords on import, I can add keywords of, you know, uh, class pictures, I can uh, demo, things like that. So that then if I want to go and find pictures that, um, that I want to use for a demo, I can, I can search by the keyword. I can even make a smart collection that automatically gets those keywords, right? So if you, uh, it doesn't have to be about, obviously about animals. If you have pictures of your children and you keyword them, with their names, then every year you can go through and say, okay, I want to, I want every picture that was taken in 2019 that has the keyword, you know, little Johnny. And then all the pictures of little Johnny in 2019 will automatically be collected. And you can set that up at the end of the year. You can set that up at the beginning of the year so that it keeps track as you go. Um, whatever you want to do, uh, Lightroom has a way for you to find whatever it is that you're, that you're looking for. I'm gonna look, I guess there's no question. Any, any questions right now before we move on? Cool, okay. Um, so there's things, every picture that I make goes through this process in Lightroom. It goes into a folder that is imported into Lightroom. And, or, and again, to be clear, when I say import a folder into Lightroom, I mean, tell Lightroom where that folder is, right? I mean, add a, uh, an instance of that folder to the Lightroom database. Let's see. Yes, this is, this is the new Lightroom. This is Lightroom CC. The question was, are all these settings the same in new Lightroom? Um, this, I have been using everything I've told you so far since, Lightroom 2. And this, if they were still doing numbers, this would be like Lightroom 12, I think, or 13. Um, I have literally been using this exact, everything so far is exactly how I've been using Lightroom for 10 years, 13, I don't know, for years. Um, the only thing that, uh, that usually changes in Lightroom is the develop module. That's where they spend the most time on upgrades and things like that, aside from trying to make it faster uh, and that sort of thing. Let's see. Gotcha. This is Lightroom Classic. I'm using Lightroom Classic CC. 
the other Lightroom is is the cloud version, the CC Lightroom, and it looks more like basically what they what Adobe did in that case was take the iPad app and make it a desktop app as well. Um, you can still do. Um, let me see. Let me look just so I can. Let's let's look, shall we? Let's look at Lightroom. And it is confusing. I wish they had come up with a different name. Um, so the difference is on um, on Lightroom CC, which this is on just now they just call it Lightroom. Uh, now it's albums instead of uh, instead of collections. So when I go to when I go here and share my collection, okay, when I uh, synchronize this collection with Lightroom CC with, with the, uh, the Adobe Cloud, then it ends up here. It ends up as an album here. Okay. Um, there's a lot of reasons that I don't use that all the time. Um, uh, let's see. I know some of the birds. I'm not a great birder. Um, some photos that were exactly the same, but had different formats. Uh, are you talking about raw and JPEG, I guess? Um, normal, sometimes I shoot raw plus JPEG. Some of these, uh, for example, okay, that, that's probably what you're talking about. Um, like this picture is a TIFF file because I've taken the raw file and I exported it to uh, Topaz Denoise. And then from D to, to open it in Denoise, I save it as a TIFF. So it ends up being basically the same file, but once the raw file and once the TIFF. So I'll edit the raw file in Lightroom. And then um, you can't send a, uh, an edited raw file into a plugin usually. So that's why you end up with um, like, I think there's, yeah, like these, these two here, it's the same file. It's, but this is the TIFF and this is the original raw file. I believe that answers your question. Um, so again, this is this is Lightroom Classic. This is um, this is the way Lightroom has looked since it came out. And the other, the CC version, um, the the Lightroom version. A lot of the editing tools are the same. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Thank you. Um, but uh, but yeah, the storage options, the organization is a, looks a little bit different. Yes. Uh, but again, instead of collections, we're going to use albums. And the difference in this Lightroom and Lightroom Classic is that this Lightroom does copy your pictures and put them in the cloud. Okay, anything you put in Lightroom, uh, the CC version is uploaded to the cloud. Now, uh, this is really important. Actually, I was just uh, doing looking at this for work because I don't have a lot of experience with this version, except on my phone and my iPad. Uh, and it's definitely a benefit if you're working, sometimes you're working mobile and sometimes you're working on your desktop. Using this version is a huge benefit because it looks exactly the same on your phone and your iPad as it does right here. So there's no translation that needs to happen. And, and if you learn the tools one place, they work the same on the other. Um, but as my, uh, my boss was asking me how we get a local backup because he only uses this Lightroom. He only uses the, the cloud version. So he wants to have a way to have the original files on his on a hard drive as a backup. So uh, it's really easy. You go to preferences and I believe on the PC it's under the edit menu. I believe the, present, uh, the uh, preferences are on the edit menu. And then you just check this box, store a copy of all originals at the specified location. And then you hit browse and tell it where to save the, the originals. And then it will download your original files to the hard drive. So anytime you put something into Lightroom, it will save a copy to a hard drive. And then you have two copies, um, which is, is kind of backwards from the traditional way that you might back things up. Normally, like the way that I do it, and I've done it for years, is I have all my images on an external hard drive, and then I back them up to the to a cloud somewhere. 
So that's just the opposite, basically. You you have your cloud, you have everything stored in the cloud, and then you download them to a hard drive as a backup. So I will say too that the the basic things that I'm going to show you here are in the develop module in Lightroom Classic, but every tool that I'm going to show you is is in the other Lightroom as well, and and I'll switch back and forth as much as I can in in the short time that we have. Um, let's see. You betcha. You're welcome. Um, so we've got pictures. Uh, we want them to look uh, the best. So I, I'm going to start with my starred images. I'm not going to start with uh, with pictures that need a ton of work. Because for me, if a picture needs a ton of work, it's, it didn't work. <laughs> it's not a good picture. So I, I am not a guy who snaps a lot of pictures so that I can fix them after the fact. I, don't, I just don't do that. And, and um, maybe it's laziness. I, I don't know if it's experience. I don't know. I know that I enjoy much more to, to see light, to understand when the light is good, to understand how to use a camera to capture that, and to intentionally make a picture at the time that's really close to what I want it to look like. Sometimes that's not possible, right? Sometimes I'm in the rainforest in Costa Rica and I see some amazing creature that I've never seen before, but it's dark. We're under three levels of forest canopy and it's just, and I'm at ISO 6400 and I'm just trying to get a record of the thing. And so I can try to make that in something. As often as possible, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna shoot when the light is the best. I'm gonna shoot when whatever my subject is, is in the perfect spot. I'm going to move my position uh, so that I can uh, arrange my subject in the right place. That and, and when I say the right place, I don't mean according to the rules. I mean the place that I want it, right? Because that's the important thing. Study the rules, but you still have to make yourself happy with your pictures. But you know, I, this, this right here is a good example. If you've ever been to the to Central America, you've seen a crested blonde. They're like pigeons, they're everywhere, but they're these huge jungle turkeys, right? And they, they, flit, they just flit around in the trees as if they're sparrows, like they don't realize they're the size of a turkey. And they're, it makes them kind of hilarious. But to, to make a picture of a crested blonde that I think, I'm really proud of this picture, um, is cool. But he sat there and so, it was raining and he wasn't really going anywhere. So I had time to move around and arrange him perfectly so that this sort of spray of leaves was behind him. And then I got the frame exactly like I wanted. And then I waited for him to turn around. So he's turning into the light and, uh, and all these things. For me, that is much more fun than just snapping a shot of a crested guan and then trying to fix it later, you know? Um, anyway, uh, tangent, uh, another tangent here, but what I want to do is make sure that this file is as good as it can be, right? So when I go into the develop module, a couple of things are, are going to happen automatically. And, and I'll show you how to do that, how to, how to save your settings automatically. The, one of the most important things that you can do in Lightroom is learn about camera profiles. And I'll show you in, the, uh, in Lightroom CC profile. There you go. If you go to edit, it's the first thing, this is a camera profile. Now, what this, this is basically like choosing what's, what kind of film you're going to use. The profile, so notice uh, this, here we are in the, uh, in the develop module in the basic panel. So these are your basic, ex, basic controls for exposure and contrast and all these things, right? Um, you can adjust how bright the image is, you can adjust the, the contrast, you can adjust the color, all these things with all these sliders, of course, okay? But the profile is your base raw process. If you're shooting JPEGs, you cannot, there's no profile. The, the profile is baked in in the camera. But if you're shooting raw, then get to know these profiles. And I'll show you, uh, if you click this button here, excuse me, you can see the, um, what your options are. 
there, there's Adobe ones and these camera matching profiles are very important. What, what Adobe has done for these camera matching profiles, for example, on my Olympus cameras, I can change the, the photo style, muted, natural, portrait, vivid, all these things are settings I can put in the camera. Okay, now if you set that in the camera, it only applies to a JPEG image out of the camera. It's not going to apply to your raw file. So, for example, I really like the, cam the natural uh, picture style in my camera. So, if I'm using my camera in the natural picture style, then I want to be sure that I'm using the same profile in Lightroom so that when I open the picture, it's going to look like I expect it to because it looks like the JPEG preview on my camera. Okay. Um, if a lot of us have had the experience, I know I did years ago, um, the first version or two of, Adobe, of Lightroom didn't have camera profiles. So I would, uh, I would shoot, I don't remember if I was shooting a Canon camera or a Nikon camera at the time, but I, I really liked my Nikon cameras in the vivid mode. I really like that, that bold color, the nice contrast. So I would open a picture in Lightroom and it would, it would look nice and bold and then it would go boop, and it would go flat. And I would go, what, why is it doing that? And so what happens is every raw file has a JPEG preview embedded in it. It's the image that the camera shows you on the back of the camera. The camera doesn't show you your raw file, it shows you a JPEG preview. So when Adobe opens your file, it, should, it just shows you that JPEG until it builds its own preview, which then didn't have that profile applied to it, so it looks flat. If that's ever happened to you, this is why. Um, so I'll show you, if you don't change these, this is what you get. You get Adobe Color, okay? So let's say I took this picture and I opened it up in Lightroom. I would, this looks pretty flat, right? The green doesn't really look particularly green. Uh, it's it's kind of ugly, yellowy. There's not a lot of contrast. It looks, I would, I would have to do a lot of work on this, this picture, right? So if I close that up, that, that didn't change any of my settings at all, okay? All I did was change the profile to Adobe Color. So let's put camera natural. So in this case, this would match what I thought the picture was gonna look like out of the camera. That's a little different, right? The green is totally different. If I undo that, see that's the Adobe Color and that's the camera matching profile. Wow, that's a huge difference, right? So if you are using you know, camera natural and then you open it in Lightroom and it shows you Adobe Color, you're like, this camera sucks, these pictures, are these uh, colors are terrible. So notice it didn't change any of my settings. I'm still at zero. This is just the base processing for your raw file. So you can take that one step further uh, and use something called a, a color checker and you photograph a, a patch of measured colors, run that picture through some software and then it actually calibrates your camera sensor the same way that you calibrate your monitor. So what I've got here is now, this is my calibrated colors. And they're not as, the contrast is not as bold as it was with the camera natural. The, the, uh, the colors aren't as saturated as they were with the camera natural, but this is a measured, this is what it really looked like. Uh, and, you know, I've had uh, actually a, a good, Friend of mine, one of my colleagues was telling me, he's like, yeah, if I was doing product photography, I would do that, but I don't bother for wildlife. But I can tell you, I don't, I'm not sure if this one makes a huge difference, but the, your camera profile is going to affect your histogram. So if you've got Adobe Color uh, and it's flat, and then you use the, the measured profile, a lot of times it, it depends on the image and, and what the tonality is, but it will actually spread out the histogram. It will actually take advantage of more of the data in the raw file because it actually reads the colors in, in a real way. It, it reads the colors based on uh, a measurement that was taken of your particular sensor. And I can tell you from past experience, Nikon cameras don't show you blue until you calibrate the, the sensor. When I calibrated my Nikon D700 years ago, I was like, oh my God, like blue and purple, all of a sudden looks blue and purple. And before that, you don't even realize how bad it renders blue until you calibrate that, that sensor. Um, I've noticed that it even makes a difference with the amount of uh, grain in the image, the amount of noise. It just, it really fine tunes that picture and makes it as good as it's going to get. So everything 
that I open ends up with this profile, okay? Or whatever the profile is, you have to have one for each specific camera that you use. Um, the other thing that I do on every image is uh, I'm gonna hit uh, Command-5 and go to the Detail panel. And it's, it's sharpening and noise reduction. Now, depending on what camera you have, Lightroom may or may not apply default noise reduction. In um, Canon and Nikon cameras, the in my my most recent experience, which admittedly was years ago, the default noise reduction was at 25. Okay, the default sharpening had I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the default value was, but there's defaults based on um, how the software processes those particular files and and how it thinks that they're going to look best. Um, the default noise reduction for Olympus cameras is zero. So it kind of cracks me up when people talk about how well, you know, these cameras have more, I, I see more noise than I do on my Canon uh, pictures. When I go in their Lightroom and I look in their Canon has 25 noise reduction and their Olympus has zero. Like, and if you zero it out, well, lo and behold, it looks exactly the same. So um, that's something to think about. And, uh, you know, this picture, if this is too much grain for you, I don't know what to tell you. I, I think this is fantastic. Um, but again, I have that default noise reduction and I have the, the sharpening amount of 50. And that's for my own tweaks that I do to every picture. So I know that's what I'm going to want. Uh, every time I import pictures, I don't want to have to go through and change the profile and change the sharpening and change the noise reduction. It's pretty rare that I'm going to do the same exposure changes or the same shadows and highlights or that kind of thing, but I'm going to do a similar sharpening noise reduction and definitely profile for every picture from each particular camera based on you know their characteristics. So, in order to save that, it's uh, Adobe has uh, has made it a little more convoluted to save the uh, pre the um, uh, default, and and I'm honestly. Not sure if this works the same in, in Lightroom and I'm, and I'm not gonna take your time to look at that, but I can look at that later if you wanna email me. Um, but, so now what you have to do first is create a preset. So you go over here on the left side panels at the top and hit create a preset. And you can name this whatever, you know, uh, default and then whatever the camera is. And so you want to save the treatment. You can check none and then check the treatment and the noise reduction and the sharpening. Okay. And you create this preset. Now, um, I'm not going to do that because I already have one saved. But now that you have the preset saved, you don't have to go in and click on that every time. You go up to your preferences. And again, on the PC, I think it's under the edit menu, uh, preferences. And, lo and here you go, there's a tab that says presets. So your raw default master settings, you're gonna choose that preset that you just made. And you're using presets, right? And uh, let's see, I'm gonna figure that out right now. But anyway, so you change that. Um, now you can click this button that says override this master setting for specific cameras. Because if I say, if I apply my EM1X profile to my EM1 Mark III cameras, it's going to say that we don't have that profile because you can't use the same, a, a specific calibrated, you can't use the same camera profile for different models. So you have to override that and then you select the camera, select the default for that, and then you save a list here. Of, of what the basics are. You can see I've done that for three different camera models. I've done that for my drone um, so that when those raw files get imported, they have the, the base level settings adjusted so that then I can go from there and adjust the color and the contrast and, and uh, exposure, whatever I want to do specifically for those images. So if you figure that part of Lightroom out, the organization, and getting your raw defaults, then you will be a happier photographer in Lightroom because the rest of it is all just to taste and it's all just figuring out what these things do. And um, I will say, let's see, is it that? Yes, it is. Uh, if you command forward slash, it should it brings up this panel in whatever module you're in with the, the keyboard shortcuts for that module. So 
I don't recommend getting a book and using flashcards and teaching yourself every keyboard shortcut in Lightroom. But I do recommend when you that you pay a little bit of attention to the things that you do all the time in Lightroom. For example, um, G takes you back to the grid in the library module. You do that all the time in Lightroom. If you're working on a picture, you go in the develop module, you press D to take that picture into the develop module. Okay. Um, if you find yourself doing the same things over and over again, if you find yourself going up to the menu for the same thing over and over again, then go, man, I bet there's a keyboard shortcut for that. And there probably is. And you can hit command forward slash and figure out what it is. You know, hide the panels, uh, the shortcuts spe for specifically for that module. Um, and if you just do that, just learn one keyboard shortcut at a time for stuff that you're doing all the time before you know it. I don't ever go up here. I don't even know what's in these menus, honestly, because I can do anything I want by either right-clicking on the picture or with keyboard shortcuts. Um, P is a pick flag. The one through five on the keyboard adds one to five stars. The six, seven, eight, and nine are color labels. Uh, it's, it's all kinds of stuff. And I don't even realize um, that I learned keyboard shortcuts, except I would start doing something and go, I need to learn the shortcut for that. And you know, people ask me like, how do I make a, a virtual copy? Oh, it's command apostrophe. And they look at me like, how in the world do you know? Because at some point I was making, I, I was doing a project and I had to make a bunch of virtual copies and it was easier to, to learn that keyboard shortcut. Let's see what the question is. Um, sure, you can, um, you can email me about doing uh, another club thing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to be done at 832. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually done right now. So I don't even blame you. Uh, so I'm going to stop that and we can, if there's other questions or, uh, you want to pick me up. Can you, um, can you tell us some of the things you do like workshops and, um, day workshops, things like that? That is an interesting question at this point, because I just, uh, took a day job. And so I have a workshop in Costa Rica in September, but for this, and I wasn't able to plan anything uh, internationally because of uh, the pandemic, of course. And so at this point, I'm going to be doing kind of things like this, and I'm going to be working and, and photographing here locally. So um, I'm honestly not sure how that's going to work out after, you know, after the world turns back on. <laughs> All right. So, All right. At this point, I'm pleased that I have, I'm, I get to do creative photography and writing and all sorts of different things and get a, a draw salary. And <laughs> so, um, I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. You gotcha. Rob, do you use uh, smart previews? Uh, I don't, I don't need to. Mm -hmm. When I'm when I'm working, I'm usually sitting at my desk and I have the hard drive plugged in, so I don't. Okay. I don't don't usually need to. That was smart previews. That was... Yeah, smart previews are a larger version of the the working preview that Adobe that Lightroom makes, and you can do that either automatically or specifically for different, you know, folders or uh, collections or whatever, so that if you have your files on an external hard drive, you don't have to have that drive plugged in in order to make edits. But um, again, if I'm working, I'm usually sitting at my desk with my hard drives yeah. plugged in. So yeah, that's something that's come up as I've been trying to reconfigure my, my Lightroom after my Windows incident. So yeah, Thanks. yeah, it, it takes up a lot more space in your um, catalog file. So I don't think it's really necessary. Thanks, Barry. I'm glad you glad you came. Uh, any other questions? Rob, do you do much where you edit in Lightroom and then go into something like Photoshop and then bring that back to Lightroom to do more edits? Or do you do most of your edits just in Lightroom? I, I do most of my edits in Lightroom um, with the, the targeted adjustment brush and uh, um, the gradient filters and, and that stuff. I, I Most of my day-to-day -day stuff, I, I do that. Um, I'm doing more, you know, like, real estate and architecture now. So I'm for that, there's not really any, aside from the photo merge and HDR, 
there's not really any blending options in Lightroom. So I do, you know, I'll open those in Photoshop as layers and, and work on that. But then, yeah, then I'll bring it back into Lightroom and do the final, uh, final edits there. All right, I think that sounds like that's it. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to Thank see you. I appreciate it, Rob. Thanks so much. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of relearning Windows, uh, not Windows, uh, Lightroom now. I've been using on one for about three months mm -hmm. uh, because it was faster than Lightroom, but now Lightroom is faster than on one. Uh, uh, I don't know why. I think it had something to do with <laughs> when I reinstalled uh windows but this was a good um uh refresher for me and right. uh folks can uh email you or um contact you on facebook if they have questions absolutely it's rob at rob night photography.com for right. sure excellent excellent and this uh, video like i said will be on our uh, youtube channel uh soon um yeah. we're gonna do our um our monthly challenge and so you're welcome to stay if you want to Gonna see our work. <laughs> it's totally up to you. But thanks so much, Rob. Yeah, I wish I wish I did have time to stay. I've gotta I've gotta find something to eat and see my family <laughs> for a minute. <laughs> so. All right. But, th but thanks, thanks for having me. You All right. You. Take care. Appreciate it. All right. I am gonna go back and share my screen. Maybe. Let's see. There we go, maybe, okay. There you go. All right, yeah, everything is backwards on my screen since I reinstalled uh, Windows, so <laughs> I'm a little off kilter tonight. So, like I said, we're gonna do something a little bit different before we do our, um, our challenge tonight. We're gonna do a quick review of three pictures from the uh, January challenge. Uh, Dick Snoke, um, he told me which three pictures he voted for uh, last month. And he's just gonna give you real quick reasons why he uh, voted for those. Uh, next month, um, Rick Olson is gonna tell us which three pictures from tonight he voted for and just kind of a quick reasons why. And this is just kind of because a lot of people are asking for critiques. So these aren't gonna be full-fledged critiques, but you can kind of see what people are looking looking for with images. So um, these aren't in any particular order, um, Dick. I just threw them in here, but they're the three you okay. told me. That's the first one. Okay, so... And the theme my... last month was America the Beautiful. That might be important for people who weren't here last month to know. Yeah, so I really like this one for several reasons. One is it's an outstanding job of panning that really got the car sharp and the background background nicely blurred like that a lot fits the theme with the red white and blue and the car racing as far as that goes although it would have been even better if it was nascar um i also like the fact that it's a little bit angled i think he's actually driving uphill but even if he wasn't i think it really works to, to have the thing slanted um that what i the only thing i really didn't like if i was processing it i probably would have desaturated the the bottom part, that bottom brown part of the uh, of the picture, and maybe a little bit of the green at the top, uh, just to make the car pop out a little bit more. But that's that that's and I I think I voted for this one in second place actually. But um, and then the next one. Oh. Yeah, go next. All right. Okay. Yeah, and th this one again really fits the theme. That's really an awesome view. Um, and tells, I mean, it tells an important story because the Cherry Blossom Festival in DC is always a big deal. But I really like the, the fact that the, the cherry tree takes up visually most of the picture to me, but the capital is there enough that you really get the, the message. Um, and I like, like that juxtaposition of the natural of the cherry tree and the hand of man with the capital. Um, I also like the fact in this case that the sky is not blue. Um, I think a blue sky in there would have really yucked up the picture. Um, I think this is one example where an overcast day 
and blown out. I mean, you, that, that sky could have been blown out a little more even and it wouldn't have hurt. Um, the other thing I like is that the colors seem really natural to me. It isn't oversaturated, just it's the way it ought to be. Um, and for me personally, I tend to oversaturate things. So this is sort of a big personal note to myself. Okay, next slide, Mike. All right. Yeah, now this, this one, I think I voted in third place. It's really a spectacular view. I mean, it really is with the stacked mountains and the, the V in the valley going down to that little lake and the tremendous sky. Um, and I mean, you gotta get lucky sometimes to get a picture like that and just be in the right place at the right time. What I don't like about this picture, and I, again, it's something I tend to do to myself a lot is it looks to me like the, um, uh, the foreground, particularly the trees, they look like they've been, I don't know, over sharpened, maybe something. Um, they look kind of plastic, like, the, like plastic trees stuck in there. Um, and the other thing that I think I, I find unnatural, I guess, is that those light rays appear to go all the way to the ground, which I don't think is a natural effect. I think, again, it may have been a over sharpen or over saturate or over contrast or something. But the, the overall, it's, it's, I mean, I think it's a tremendous image. When I saw it, it was like, wow, that's really cool. But just a few seconds of looking at it, it's like, yeah, it's not exactly right in my, my view. That's, uh, so that otherwise, I think this one would have, been, would have been first place for me. Anyway, that's it, Mike. Quick enough. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Dick. And, uh... Uh, Rick, Rick Olson is going to do the same thing next month, um, whatever three images he votes for tonight. And what these people who are giving their um, opinions, it's not necessarily going to be the winners. It's going to be what they voted on. They may not necessarily vote on the, uh, uh, for one of the winners, but it's what they like best. And as we know, um, photography is very subjective. So it's just kind of a little helpful information, I think, for everybody. So hopefully you like that. Um, so here are our themes for the year. Uh, this month it's uh, bridges. A uh, couple rules, um, it's one image per person. Image must be less than two years old. Uh, no composites. Uh, you must be a, a paid member. You must be attending the meeting, but we do allow you to miss one meeting per year. If you place, um, then you'll still get the uh, points. Um, in fact, the winner uh, last month was not at the meeting, but his points will count, but he can't miss another meeting. And then something new we're doing this year, the photographer of the year is going to win $100. Um, the voting, you're going to vote on uh, your three favorites, first, second, and third place. Uh, don't vote for the same photo multiple times. Uh, when you're voting, think about whether or not the, uh, the uh, image fits the theme. Tonight it's pretty easy because the theme is bridges. Sometimes it's not as easy. You're going to email your vote to vote at ngaphoto.club. It's not photo.com, it's ngaphoto.club. And then Lisa will uh, tally the votes and uh, we'll get the winners posted either uh, tonight or uh, sometime tomorrow. And we basically, we award points for the top five. So it's five points for first place, four for second, three for third and so on. And at the end of the year, the uh, photographer with the uh, most points is gonna be wins photographer of the year. And they're gonna win that $100. Uh, they'll also get um, a little trophy and uh, we'll pay, the club will pay their membership for the following year, so. Hey, Mike, that, quick question. Yes. Um, I haven't heard this, but uh, shouldn't be, is there, isn't there a rule that you cannot vote for your own picture? I mean, it's going to be um, maybe it is, an, it is an unwritten rule. Okay. Uh, we used to have it as a written rule, but it's really not anything that we can enforce. Uh, my suggestion, the way I've been doing this, and um, before I was even a club officer, I never voted for my own pictures. Um, vote your conscience is all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I, I never vote for. Uh, mine whether i think it's the best or not the best um that, that's just my personal opinion um 
I've had conversations with others who disagreed with that. Um, so just do your conscience what I say. That's why I took it out of the rules. So we have uh, 20 pictures tonight. This is the most we've had in a long time. So uh, let's get started on that. So this is, uh, and I'll go through these a couple of times. This is number one. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine, ten, eleven, whoops, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. 19 and 20. <clears throat> now I'll go through them again uh, backwards, a little bit faster, <clears throat> starting with number 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Two and one. And do it one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, <clears throat> ten, eleven, <clears throat> losing my voice here, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. And 20. Does anyone need to see any of them again? If not, go ahead and uh, just send your votes to vote at ngaphoto.club, not .com, but vote at ngaphoto.club. 
It is 8.45 right now. So you have till nine o'clock to uh, get your votes in. Next month, uh, our meeting will be on Friday, March 19th at 7 p.m. Our presentation is gonna be uh, by Mark Alberhaski. He's a Nikon mentor and educator. Um, he is going to be discussing uh, cell phone photography and he's also gonna be a guest judge. Um, we're gonna try this out next month. He's gonna actually judge the um, photo contest next month instead of us voting. Um, so it should be um, interesting and we'll have to get our images in a couple days early uh, so that he has a chance to go through them because I think he's gonna kind of do a quick critique on the images as we go along, uh, but I'll uh, give you more information as we go. But uh, it was uh, something we wanted to try out and uh, Mark was willing to do that. And our uh, theme next month is gonna be uh, VOCA. And that's it. So thanks for coming. I hope everybody has a uh, good weekend. I hope I uh, see some of you bright and early tomorrow morning at uh, 17th Street. And uh, watch for the uh, winners to be posted uh, soon and watch for the um, purchasing links for the uh, zoo and for the uh, uh, Birds of Prey um, event. And of course, any questions, just let me know. And uh, this video will either be on YouTube tonight or sometime uh, this weekend. So have a good evening, everybody. Thanks, Mike. <coughs> Thanks, Bye. good night. Good night. Good night, Good night all. Good night, everyone. Farewell.